We continue our lecture with the next group of uh, eukaryotic microorganisms uh, which are helminths or parasitic worms. What you have to remember is uh, worms are most of them uh, multicellular and macroscopic. For example, a tapeworm can reach up to uh, 30 feet long. So the question is, uh, why do we study uh, helminths in microbiology if they are not microscopic? The answer is because helminths cause infectious diseases in humans. In this semester, on this semester, we're going to talk about two groups of helminths. Those are round worms, and the second group, the second group is flat worms. From a group of flat worms, we're going to cover flukes and tapeworms, because those two groups that infect people. And we begin with uh, tapeworms. And uh, all tapeworms bel belong to group of flatworms uh, because they have flattened bodies of the adult worms. Let's start with the structure of the tapeworm. The first uh, part of the tapeworm you have to know is called sculix. sculix. Uh, it's used for attachment. It has hooks in the structure and, uh, as I said, used for attachment. Uh, to the surface of the mucous membranes of intestine. And then the neck-like structure, the next one, is called germinal center. The function of germinal center is to make segments, or we call them proglottids. So this is the next part of uh, tapeworm. You have to know the rest of the body of the tapeworm is actually made of proglottids or segments. What is the function of those proglottids? Proglottids produce or make and fertilize eggs. Because each segment can produce and fertilize eggs, it means tapeworms are hermaphrodites. That means each proglottid, each segment, has males and females reproductive organs. I already told you that a tapeworm is a huge worm. It can reach up to 25 to 30 feet long. What else you have to know? You have to know two types of tapeworms. Those are beef, tapeworm or tinea saginata and pork tapeworm or tinea solium. We continue with the life cycle of the beef tapeworm. The life cycles of some tapeworms pass through two forms. Adult form or adult worm and larva or larval form. The source of adult worm will be gastrointestinal tract of infected humans. Larval forms generally develop in a muscle, brain, eye, liver and heart tissue of the animals, infected animals. The picture on this slide shows you life cycle of a beef tapeworm. Uh, let's start from the point how humans uh, get infected. Humans get infected when they eat undercooked beef that contains seized of beef tapeworm. When humans ingest those cysts within the GI tract of that human, cyst turns inside out and using sculix attaches to the surface of the intestinal tract of that human. And then worm starts growing. It starts forming proglottids. Within each proglottid, uh, eggs will be produced and fertilized. When eggs are fertilized within proglottid, then the last 
proglottid or segment will be detached from the rest of the body of that worm and uh, will be excreted into feces of that person. If untreated human waste is deposited on the field, then cattle that eats there will swallow the eggs. Within the GI tract of those cows, eggs will hatch and produce larvae. Larvae are motile. They can penetrate the intestinal wall, then move to the muscle tissue, liver, brain of those animals, and this is where they get encapsulated and form cysts, and form cysts, which is resting form of this worm. And once again, how humans get infected? When humans eat undercooked beef that contains those cysts. What are the symptoms of a tapeworm infection? Uh, probably the main symptom of this infection will be a loss of weight. Uh, those patients are usually have very good appetite, eat a lot, but still uh, they lose huge amount of weight. What else uh, can, can be seen in those patients? Uh, all helminthic infections, including tapeworm infection, uh, irritate humans' uh, uh, immune system. And very often those patients develop hypersensitivity reactions. They can develop rash on the skin, uh, symptoms of arthritis, symptoms of asthma, and so on. Uh, the next group of uh, flatworms uh, we're going to cover is flukes. Uh, flukes uh, also have flattened uh, body. Uh, same as the uh, uh, tapeworms, uh, they can exist in two forms, larval form and uh, adult worm. Uh, but in their uh, life cycle, they have two intermediate hosts. For example, the first one might be a snail or clam, and the second intermediate host can be fish, crab, or water plant. Uh, flukes are very small uh, worms, they are just few millimeters uh, long, and they develop a little bit better than uh, tapeworms. In humans, uh, flukes uh, can be found in the blood vessels, liver, and uh, lungs. Uh, on this slide you see a picture of anatomy of the fluke and the uh, same as a tapeworm, it is hermaphrodite uh, because it has males and females uh, reproductive organs in each worm. Uh, but as I said, it developed a little bit better because it already has a very simple intestine in its structure. Uh, let's talk about a life cycle of flukes and uh, you see a life cycle of fluke on this uh, picture on this slide. Let's start how humans get infected. Uh, people get infected when they eat second intermediate host, for example, crawfish on this picture, that contains a larva of fluke. Within GI tract uh, of human, larva will develop into adult worm, which starts producing eggs eggs will be excreted in the feces. If those feces, contaminated feces, get in the water, the first larval form will be developed in the water. Larva can swim, so larva will swim and look for first intermediate host. On this picture you see a snail. Then the first larval form penetrates uh, shell of the sna snail and within the body of the first intermediate host it will develop into second larval form. The second larval form leaves body of the first intermediate host and swim and look for the second intermediate host and again once again on this picture it will be a crawfish. Within the body of the second intermediate host, larva will develop into cyst. 
and then humans get infected when they eat infected second intermediate host. We're finished with the uh, first group of uh, helminths, uh, flatworms, and the next group uh, will be roundworms. Uh, roundworms develop much better than uh, flatworms. Uh, for example, they already have their own uh, very simple uh, nervous system. Uh, their digestive system is uh, completely developed already. And also they are not hermaphrodites. Uh, they have separate male and female worms. And uh, the first group of round worms we're going to cover is pinworms or Enterobius vermicularis. Uh, pinworm infection is the most common helminthic infection in the United States. What group of patients will be affected by pinworm infection? Children. Uh, children usually get infected uh, by this infection when they uh, take to the mouth um, objects uh, that uh, have uh, eggs of the pinworm on the surface. So basically we can say that uh, pinworm infection is transmitted by fecal oral route of transmission. When eggs of pinworms are ingested within GI tract of that uh, person, uh, they will hatch and develop into uh, male and female adult worms. Male and female uh, adult worms mate uh, in the intestinal tract and then the females crawl out and lay their eggs on the skin or mucous membranes near the anus. When uh, worms lay uh, their eggs on the mucous membranes uh, around the anal area, it creates a lot of uh, itching sensations. And uh, sometimes this is the only symptom uh, that uh, this infection produces. Uh, many people suffer no symptoms at all. The next round worm is Trichinella spira spiralis. It causes trichinellosis in humans. The life cycle of uh, uh, this round worm is very similar to, little, to the life cycle of the tapeworm because uh, Trichinella spiralis can also exist in two forms, larval form and adult worm. And the source of uh, larval form will be animals and the source of adult worm will be infected humans. Let's look at this picture. How people get inf infected? Uh, people get infected with this uh, infection, with this worm, when they eat undercooked pork that contains cysts of this worm. Within that, uh, within a GI tract of infected human, that cyst will develop into adult worm. And adult worm will start producing eggs, which will be excreted in feces. When contaminated human waste uh, gets uh, on the foot of the animals, on this picture you see as an example a pig, then animal will ingest those eggs and within GI tract of that animal, eggs will develop into larva. Then larva, uh, because it's motile, moves to the muscle tissue of that animal where it gets uh, encapsulated and will form cyst. And once again, humans will get infected when they eat undercooked pork containing cysts of Trichinella spiralis. And the last part of this lecture, uh, on the last part, part of this lecture, we're going to talk about arthropods. What are those arthropods? Uh, those are insects that transmit infectious diseases. We call them vectors because they transmit infections. There are two types of vectors you have to know. Mechanical vectors and uh, biological vectors. Mechanical vectors mechanically pick up 
pathogens in certain areas and then carry them to places where humans uh, live and uh, contaminate food. As an example of mechanical factor, we can use a house fly. A uh, fly uh, somewhere outside an environment uh, uh, lands on the feces, contaminated feces. Uh, from that uh, from that area, it picks up a lot of different GI tract pathogens. The next step, it flies into our kitchen, lands on the surface of our food, contaminates it, we eat it, and develop infection. So that is an example of mechanical vector, because mechanical vectors mechanically move pathogens from one area to another area. And then the second uh, type of vectors, uh, those are biological vectors. Biological vectors are part of the life cycle of uh, each particular pathogen. For example, today we talked about a plasmodium malaria life cycle. And I told you that uh, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. But it's not just transmitted by mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes are part of the life cycle of plasmodium malaria. So that is an example of biological vector. Please remember, besides the fact that vectors um, actually transmit infections, they also can cause hypersensitivity reactions or allergic reactions in our patients, because a lot, a lot of them are able to bite and inject venom. And on the next slide, uh, you see a few examples of arthropod vectors, uh, insects, uh, those are ticks, uh, louse, mosquitoes, fleas,